Hello and good morning. And I'm Dan Galpin. And according to a recent Google search that I did, it turns out that there are lots of things that people are scared of. Uh, things like airplanes and flying and snakes and spiders and going to the dentist and uh, public speaking. And uh, even the number 13 for those triskaidekaphobics out there. Um, but a new release of Android is nothing to fear, and even if it is the 13th release. So I'm going to cover two things in this talk. The basic process for dealing with migrating to a new Android platform release, along with how this applies to Android 13 specifically in terms of the changes it brings and how they might apply to your app, and how to dig deeper into this content with other ADS talks. Remember, there are three kinds of people, those who can count and those who cannot. When migrating to a new Android release, I look for behavior changes and new features that I can potentially utilize to differentiate my app. And a behavior change really is a big deal because it means that this app that worked fine on earlier releases of Android may not work exactly the way that you expect them to on this new release. So for that reason, we really try to limit these kinds of changes to things that impact system health and a focus on battery life and system performance, things like user privacy and the security of the OS and your app. Now, some of these changes apply to all apps, and some of them only apply once your target SDK version actually targets Android 13's API level 33. So, the first line of defense is to test your app thoroughly on the new release, and this just means, you know, Android 13. And it's available in many places, such as the Android emulator, the, you know, supported Pixel devices, partner devices, and things like the Firebase Test Lab. And the Behavior Changes page on developer.android.com is a guide for what to focus on, and I'll be covering some of the more notable changes in this talk. Beginning with changes that impact all apps, regardless of their target SDK version. And the over goal of these changes is to, is to give the user more awareness and control of what apps are doing in the background. Now, users told us that they really, really wanted foreground service notifications to be dismissible. So we added that. To then provide more clarity around what apps are doing in the background, we created the foreground services task manager. And if your app is using a foreground service, it gets included in this new interface that allows the user to end the foreground service, which also closes your app. You can use ADB for testing to stop your app exactly the way the FGS task manager does using this stop app command. And in many ways, this is really similar to the force stop command, um, which you can do from the app info page or from the force stop ADB shell interface. Unlike force stop, though, it doesn't actually remove the app from history. And it doesn't cancel scheduled jobs and alarms. So this should actually be easier and have a less of a long-term impact on your app. Now, when your app is stopped in the FGS Task Manager, you won't get any callbacks from the system, but you can check what happens the next time your app starts using the Application Exit Info API. And this will tell you if the user stopped your app and allows you to check for things like crashes from ANRs, unhandled exceptions, and low memory. And there are two takeaways from this for me. First, as always, make sure your app can, can handle being stopped at any state, minimizing data loss. Second, this is a really good time to do some analysis and see if you really need to rely on foreground services. Because uh, foreground services uh, really uh, uh, reduce the flexibility for Android to be able to schedule things. And using jobs is just better for the system health. And speaking of background activity, on Android 13, your app requires a much shorter period of inactivity to be replaced in the restricted app standby bucket. We added these in Android 12, and when you're in restricted mode, you can run, run jobs once per day in a 10-minute batched session, which must be run with at least one other job. You can run fewer expedited jobs, and you can invoke one alarm per day. So if your app detects that it's in restricted mode, you can help make sure your app schedules any necessary operations appropriately, and it's at least worth logging what state your app is in when you're running jobs and alarms. You can help track down any unanticipated behavior. Now, you can use ADB to test your app standby bucket if you want to run some long-term tests. But note that your app can't actually be running, because if you try to actually execute this while your app is running, the app will actually say, hey, you're, I'm being interacted with, and it'll automatically kick itself out of this restricted bucket. 
Now, one of the ways to get users to interact with your app and keep it out of those restricted buckets is to get users to you know, send them relevant actionable notifications that they interact with. But Android 13 now requires you to hold a permission in order to do that. And Android asks for this permission on your behalf if you haven't yet targeted it SDK 33. And it does this as soon as your app has an active activity and has created a notification channel. And this is different than every other time we have introduced a runtime permission. Now, if the user disallows this permission, they won't be prompted again unless they uninstall and reinstall your app, or you upgrade your app to target SDK 33. Um, now, if your app does target SDK 33 or higher, you get to manually ask the user for the notifications permission. And so you have complete control over when the permission dialog is displayed. You can call our notifications enabled, which is a Jet and Android X uh, function, to confirm whether notifications are actually enabled for your app. And notifications related to media sessions are exempt from this behavior change. But in general, the foreground service notifications are not. You can use ADB to revoke permission flags and, uh, and uh, permissions and clear permission flags for testing. And uh, be sure to catch uh, Terrence and Nake's talk coming up um, for best practices on requesting permissions, including the new notification permission. So we also have behavior changes that are related to privacy and security, as I stated before. And uh, we've locked down intent filters to behave more like I always thought they did. So on Android 13, when your app sends an explicit intent to an exported component of another app that targets SDK 33 or higher, the intent is delivered only if it actually matches the intent filter element in the receiving app. And so if your app has been relying on this legacy behavior, um, you'll have to fix things. If your app has a centralized handler for exported as well as non-exported intents, Adding a little bit of code to your receiver to filter out disallowed actions can prevent an external app from unexpectedly triggering internal code. And this is something you should do as soon as possible, even if you aren't ready to target SDK 33. Uh, we've removed the compatibility trampoline for the speech service from the Google Search app in Android 13 to use the device's default provider. Basically, this means don't specify a component name in the recognizer intent. Android 13 now has a handy pop-up that provides a visual confirmation of clipboard contents. So we've added a way to prevent sensitive data, such as passwords or credit card information, from getting shown if copied to the clipboard. And this is also something worth doing as soon as possible, regardless of what SDK version you, you target. SDK, Android 13's SDK does give you a string constant. You can just use this one. Finally, if you're relying on shared user IDs, which is a really cool feature, but it just it has problems with package managers, so please uh, migrate to supported communications mechanisms. Um, and since removing the shared user ID from your manifest also prevents your app from ever getting updated, we've added this way to migrate so it's only not used on new installs. And uh, that's really most of what you need to know about behavior changes for apps that are not targeting SDK 33. But if notifications are actually important to your app and what it does, you probably want to target SDK 33 as soon as possible. Uh, then you can request the permission in context you know, with justification. And so um, you'll also have to do this by uh, November of 2023 in order to continue making app updates on Google Play. So you might as well just get started now. So what behavior changes also happen when you target, when you uh, target SDK 33? And this is typically where we put more substantial changes, since targeting the SDK version implies that your app has actually been tested against that version. So let's start with privacy and security-related changes. And here's actually a nice one. So on earlier versions of Android, the user needs to grant your app access to find location for some common Wi-Fi use cases. But on Android 13, we introduced the nearby Wi-Fi devices runtime permission in the nearby devices group. So if you assert in your manifest that you are not using your Wi-Fi access for location, and your app doesn't use methods from the Wi-Fi manager class, such as start, scan, and get scan results, you can just use the nearby Wi-Fi device's permission. However, this means that you'll actually need to request the nearby Wi-Fi device's permission once you target SDK 33. Otherwise, accessing many Wi-Fi APIs will cause an exception to be thrown. Next, if your app needs to directly access media files created by other apps, once you target SDK 33, you need to request one or more of the granular permissions, uh, media permissions, instead of the read external storage permission. And it's even better to avoid these. Uh, in everything about storage on Android, Yasin is covering key storage concepts, along with recent APIs that go even further to preserve user privacy. 
Targeting SDK 33 also means that you have to request the new body sensor's background permission and existing because the body sensor's one to actually get access to these body sensors in the background. But it's also a hard restricted permission um, that the package installer has to allow list. So you should probably just use Health Connect if you need to consume health and fitness data. So Garen has a whole session on this. With each new Android release, we are trying to eliminate the calling of non-SDK interfaces. And when it makes sense, we're trying to replace these hidden APIs with public alternatives. As you can see, there are only four in Android 13, so I can put them all on a slide. We have system be health, uh, health behavior changes that only occur when targeting SDK 33 as well. Um, so once you target SDK 33, if your app gets in the restricted state, the system doesn't deliver the boot completed broadcast or the locked boot completed broadcast until your app has been started for other reasons. And to make it easier for you to test behavior changes, we have this thing called the compatibility framework, and it allows you to toggle on and off specific behavior changes for your app um, without even changing your app's target SDK version using either settings or ADB. So you can test this particular one, for example, by, by setting the defer boot completed broadcast change ID option. And note that your app will never get into the restricted state if the user adds your app widget. So definitely make sure uh, to see what Marcel has to say about modernizing your app widgets. The rest of the behavior changes in Android 13 are more about improving the user experience. So when targeting SDK 33, media controls are now derived semantically from the playback state that's linked to your media session, if available, rather than displaying up to five controls from media style in the order they were added. And this not only provides for richer media controls, it also aligns how they're rendered across phones, tablets, Android Auto, and Android TV. For more on how to great to create a great media experience that works well across various device hardware and platform versions, check out Nemon's talk. When targeting SDK 33, the set for Stark method in WebView is annoyed, uh, ignored. Excuse me. Uh, WebView now always sets the media query prefers color scheme according to the app's in light theme theme attribute. And you can still customize your your color theme behavior using the set algorithmic darkening and loud method in Android X. Finally, apps that target SDK 33 or higher that use advertising IDs need to request the add ID permission to the manifest. So if you're using an advertising SDK that targets this, uh, targets SDK 33, it'll hopefully do this um, automatically in your library's manifest. And this brings up one of the key things you should look for when targeting a new Android SDK release, which is um, the target SDK version of any SDKs or libraries you might be using. And this is particularly important if you're using pre-compiled libraries that target earlier SDKs, because this can cause failures. They haven't been modified to account for any recent behavior changes. And without source code, Android Studio isn't going to warn you of any potential problems. Now, you can use the Google Play SDK index to see what the target SDK level is for many commercial SDKs. So now, after all that, you're targeting Android 13 successfully. Not much there, really, but what's next? Consider getting rid of your storage permissions entirely and switching to the new Photo Picker API. And this allows the user just to share specific photos and videos with your app. And it's a rich photo exper uh, experience. It's supported back to Android 11 using an SDK extension, which is a technology that uses Google system updates with modular system components to add functionality to an OS release. And this helps us also to ensure a consistent experience across devices. Now, if the photo picker isn't available, it falls back to using Action Open Document. And this works back to SDK 19, and it has a less rich experience, but it's pretty, still pretty nice, as you can see. So using photo picker involves first registering for an activity result callback. And this selects whether you want to allow single or multiple pieces of media. And then you launch the photo picker with the type of media you want the user to select, images or videos, or both. And then you can call is photo picker available to check for the presence of the full photo picker experience if you want to provide something alternate. Internally, is photo picker available calls get extension version. And this is actually how you check for the presence of an SDK extension at runtime. So this is the future. And if you're no longer using a runtime permission like read external storage on Android 13, your app can revoke it using the revoke self permission on kill. And this is pretty cool. It's just a no-op if your app doesn't already hold the permission. And if it does, the system will kill your process opportunistically. And the next time your app is launched, the permission will no longer be held. Speaking of privacy, Aaron is covering the latest updates to Privacy Sandbox, a project that looks to, avail to enable effective, personalized advertising while improving user privacy. And this includes an overview of the project, ad tech providers, advertisers, publishers, and app developers can utilize it. 
Android 13 includes new graphics capabilities, including programmable shader effects and front buffer rendering for low latency stylus support, and Samir and Chet dive into this deeply into their Android graphics talk. Android 13 includes new communication capabilities, such as MIDI 2.0, BLE audio, ultra wideband, along with new media capabilities, such as HDR video recording, anticip anticipatory audio routing, and spatial audio. And Luke covers what new capabilities BLE audio brings to the platform, as well as how to make use of it in your VOIP applications with the Telecom API. Carlos gives an introduction to ultra wideband, a radio technology that can provide secure and accurate proximity data around nearby devices, enabling digital car keys, new home control possibilities, and more. Ray covers how you can capture, playback, and share HDR video, showing you how to test for its availability in capture and playback, as well as how to transcode your video to SDR as needed for sharing. Android 13 also includes a bunch of new text features, including Unicode updates and support for color vector fonts in the COLR v1 format. In addition to improved text support for internationalization, Android 13 now supports per-app language preferences. Whether your app already has support for per-app languages with an in-app language picker, or whether you want to add support for the feature, the AppCompat APIs in Android X make it easy to support Android 13 while being backwards compatible back to Android 4.0. For more on making your app work better for more users, including more on per-app language preferences, check out Ash's talk on building for a multilingual world. Speaking of making your app work for more users, Karen's talk on how we built accessibility support for Jetpack Compose covers the three most common accessibility services, how Android integrates with them, and how this informed the design of accessibility in Compose, along with tooling and best practices. Support for the new Tile Placement API helps users customize their Android experience, allowing apps to provide custom quick settings tiles to prompt users to add the tile in one step without leaving the app. Android 13 also includes all of the enhancements for tablets and foldables that are in Android 12L, and this just gives users better support for their favorite form factors. Rebecca covers how you can go edge to edge with your app on all form factors, take advantage of dynamic colors and Android 13's themed app icons, and get your, get your app ready for the future with support for predictive back gestures. So in conclusion, there are two things that I would like to leave you with. First, many of you will be able to migrate and target SDK 33 with minimal changes. So start testing your apps if you haven't already, because there is a lot of benefit to targeting Android 13 and a bunch of cool stuff to take advantage of. And third, we've got so many in-depth talks coming up shortly here at the Android Dev Summit Platform Day including how to make sure your app is ready for 64-bit devices like Pixel 7, um, the latest in hardware-accelerated machine learning, how to leverage attestation to improve the security of your app ecosystem, how to leverage the latest Google Play Commerce features, and the hashtag Ask Android session where the Android platform experts take your questions. And, you know, sometimes those scary things can be uh, cute and fuzzy when you examine them a bit closer, sometimes at least. So thank you.